Welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. Thank you so much for joining me. The first little bit of news that I wanted to talk about falls under the general goings on category. Mr. Ken from the Vaping with Ken YouTube channel just this last Saturday had a 24 hour live stream to raise money for suicide prevention. Ken is just a fantastic guy and I absolutely love this idea. There was a plethora of vape personalities, as it were, that jumped in on the live stream. I remember seeing Mike Vapes on there. I remember seeing Ruby Roo on there. I remember seeing Jay Hayes on there. I remember seeing basically everybody on this live stream. Everybody came out to support this live stream. I was out of town at a friend's wedding, so I wasn't able to jump on the live stream as much as I wanted to, but I just got a text from Nick Bissett Daily Vape TV this morning that told me that Ken raised 13 thousand dollars for suicide prevention. I think that's just fantastic. So huge shout out to Ken over there on Vaping with Ken YouTube and shout out to everybody that took part in this live stream and donated their money to suicide prevention. I'm going to throw a link down in the description to the Vaping with Ken YouTube channel. If you haven't had the pleasure of watching one of his videos and hearing that golden voice of his, then you are really missing out. And now we're going to kind of shift gears completely to an article that the U.S. World and News Review published in July of 2018. And this is one of my favorite articles I've run across, not because of the content in it, but because this article is kind of the blueprint on how the mainstream media really executes their fear-mongering tactics. One of the things that the mainstream media loves to do is have a big, bold, alarmist headline. Then within the article, they kind of admit that the headline is false, either completely false or based on very little information. But then they kind of end the article on the, you should still be worried, you should still be scared kind of note. This particular article from the US News and World Report has a big, fear-mongering, shocking headline. How Teenage Vaping Puts Structure in Place for Heroin and Cocaine Addiction. Really? And of course, the first thing you're gonna see in this article is a picture of kids vaping. The anti-vaping groups are the only ones portraying kids vaping. And it's interesting because this article kind of starts off on a little bit of a positive note. They talk about the data that shows that youth smoking rates are at an all-time low and how youth smoking rates over the last few years have been dropping significantly. And then they kind of paint that as a negative thing, saying that teenagers are vaping the nicotine instead of smoking, which, I'm sorry, I do not see that as a negative thing. I am a person that absolutely supports not selling to underage people. It's only in our weird, backward ass 2018 news world that low teenage smoking rates is presented by the mainstream media as a negative thing. They talk about the intense potency of Juul e-cigarette pods. They mention that a Juul pod has 50 milligrams of nicotine while one single cigarette only has 12 milligrams of nicotine. That's kind of very much a false equivalency in my opinion. Juul pods are designed for heavy smokers. They are designed for pack a day smokers. We have to remember that there's lots of people out there that smoke an entire pack of cigarettes every single day. Pack a day smokers. These pack a day smokers can get one jewel pod and go from being a pack a day smoker to a pod a day vapor. That's the real equivalency. This article really likes to lump in nicotine and THC as well. They kind of portray it that these two things go hand in hand. Like you could just walk into a vape shop and have the option of nicotine or have the option of THC. THC, which is absolutely not true. And then before we see where this article really went off the rails, I just want to point out that this particular article doesn't link to any sort of studies or references or data. They make a lot of claims like saying a study that they don't reference or link to in any capacity, but they say a study showed that 25% of teenagers moved on from e-cigarettes to smoking marijuana, as opposed to the 12.5% of high school students that smoked marijuana without using e-cigarettes first. Those numbers kind of don't make any sense to begin with, but they don't link to the study or the data to support those numbers. They're just <laughs> making claims, making claims without backing them up. Kind of like how we're still waiting for Scott Gottlieb to present any data or any evidence to show the youth vaping epidemic. They say that vaping, which is 
a verb. But they say that vaping has already progressed from nicotine to marijuana, which that statement also doesn't make any sense because cannabis users have been vaporizing their flour for just about as long as nicotine users have been vaporizing nicotine, maybe even a little bit longer. And the reason that cannabis users have been vaporizing their flour instead of smoking it is because vaporizing is healthier for you than inhaling smoke. You want to talk about tobacco harm reduction? Sure, let's talk about cannabis harm reduction. Vaping is harm reduction for more than just nicotine. It's always crazy to me how out of touch the authors of these types of articles always seem. They always seem to have that same head in the sand mentality. Like they just can't figure out why teenagers are so interested in nicotine. And they just can't figure out why teenagers want to experiment with marijuana. And they just can't remember what it's like to be a teenager. And now if you remember the headline from this article, how teenage vaping puts structure in place for heroin and cocaine addiction. Well, we're about to get to that because the last paragraph is called how heroin and cocaine could be next. I kind of just want to read the whole thing. So the last paragraph of this article says, users of heroin have been vaping it for a long time. However, they have used high heat, placing the heroin in a metal foil and using a lighter to heat it in order to vape the heroin. Inhaling vapors is preferred as it reaches the brain almost as fast as injecting the drug. Luckily, as of now, heroin and cocaine in their most common forms cannot be used in vaping devices as the tight crystal structures in heroin and cocaine bind molecules strongly, making them unvapable in the low heat that the vaping devices produce. So they basically start off the article saying that vaping leads the groundwork for cocaine and heroin addiction. They mention that youth smoking rates are at an all time low and then for some reason paint that as a very negative picture. They mention the possibility of using THC in vapor products to make it sound just that much more scary. And then they basically admit at the end that the heroin and cocaine addiction that we're all worried about all these vapors falling into it is completely unrealistic and physically impossible. But it doesn't quite stop there. They end this article with what I can only describe as the most far-reaching, ignorant, dumb, uneducated, stupid sentence that I have ever read in my entire life. However, it is predictable that drug cartels will make heroin and cocaine vapable down the road by mixing them with weak alkalis to create free bases that could be used in vaping devices. Anecdotal evidence suggests Flocka, a synthetic drug, is already being vaped. Now look, if we don't get to use the anecdotal evidence that 9 million people have quit smoking in the United Kingdom using vapor products, then you absolutely do not get to use the anecdotal evidence that drug cartels are going to innovate heroin in order to make it vapable. I genuinely don't know how anybody could read this article and take it seriously. Unfortunately, I feel like these articles are written for people people who will do no further research. And I get the unsettling feeling that there's going to be people out there now saying that drug cartels are working on vapor devices to make cocaine vapable and stating it as like a fact. I think that US News and World Report should be ashamed for publishing this. And I think Dr. Indra Sadambi, who wrote this should also be ashamed. I think if you're a doctor and you're telling the general public that they shouldn't vape, that they should be afraid of vaping, that their kids shouldn't vape, that they're kids should be afraid of vaping because the drug cartels are going to find a way to make cocaine vapable. It's one of the most uneducated things I've ever heard and you are doing a great disservice to public health. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today comes out of the FDA and it's something that Scott Gottlieb said and I can't believe I'm about to say this but I actually agree with him. This news comes from CNBC where they say that the FDA is considering limiting e-cigarette sales to vape shops in order to curb youth use. In this particular news report, Scott Godlib talks about the epidemic again, and shockingly, he doesn't supply any data or evidence to back up the epidemic claim, but this time he throws some numbers around out there. Scott Godlib cites preliminary numbers from the Federal Youth Tobacco Survey. He claims that high school e-cigarette use surged to 77 percent last year and that middle school use skyrocketed to 50 percent last year. Again, this is based on no evidence or data that we've seen so far and those numbers seem to directly conflict with the numbers that the CDC has put out regarding teenage, middle school, high school youth smoking and vaping rates. But I digress because we're here to talk about why I agree with Scott Gottlieb here, which 
I know, it's a weird thing for me to say too. Scott Godlib goes on to say that he thinks teens are buying these devices illegally, including the Juul e-cigarette device, illegally from convenience stores. Scott Godlib's actual quote is, to confront this issue, he said, regulators could limit the sales of flavored e-cigarette products to vape shops. Truly and honestly, this is something I could absolutely get behind Scott Godlib. He goes on to say, we're looking at what can be sold in brick and mortar stores and whether or not flavored products can be sold in regular stores like a 7-Eleven and a truck stop and a gas station, or whether or not flavored products on the market should be confined to adult vaping shops, which generally tend to do a better job of checking IDs. Scott Godlib talks about how this summer the agency did a retail blitz and sent out 1,300 different warning letters to retailers illegally selling the Juul and other e-cigarette devices to underage people. And none of those retailers were vape shops. All of those retailers were things like truck stops, Circle K, 7-Eleven. And like I said before, it's weird agreeing with Scott Gottlieb, but here's kind of where I land on this. I kind of agree with Scott Gottlieb. If the FDA makes the decision that flavored vapor products can only be sold in brick and mortar retail vapor shops, where underage people are more likely to get carded, and that's how he wants to prevent flavored vapor products from getting to underage people, I absolutely wholeheartedly support that. We're always talking about reasonable regulations regulations, we want reasonable regulations for vapor products, I feel like if rolled out, this could be a pretty reasonable regulation. If you want flavored vapor products, you got to go to a vape shop, you got to show your ID. This makes a whole lot of sense to me. And really, I would love to get your thoughts down in the comments below. How do you feel about the idea of flavored vapor products only being allowed in retail vapor shops, brick and mortar stores? And this article also ends talking about how the FDA is also weighing the option of banning online sales completely and literally restricting the sale of flavored vapor products to retail vapor shop brick and mortar locations. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. How important are online sales to you? Are you on an area where there are no vape shops? Do you solely rely on online sales? And as it stands right now, there's not a whole lot of information behind this online sale ban. I don't know if it's going to include any sort of hardware. The way he makes it seem is that it's flavored vapor products that they're really concerned with, not so much the hardware. So even if we go down this road of maybe only hardware being allowed to be sold online, an actual flavored vapor nicotine can only be sold in brick and mortar shops. Do you think that that would be a reasonable regulation from the FDA? Anyway, I think that's where we're going to end this 510 report. But before we go, I just want to remind everybody to join CASA. It's free and easy and effective. If you want to learn about possible bad vape legislation coming up in your particular city, state, or area, join CASA. All you need is an email and follow the calls to actions. So as Kevin Skipper used to say, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's get involved. <laughs>